Welcome friends, family, guests. We want you to know as a Bridge family that this church is glad that you're with us. We're walking through the book of 1 Peter in a sermon series entitled, No Matter What. And today you're going to be with us as we walk through a very personal part of God's word. As we come to better understand what it means to be the church and what it means to live the love that our Lord has given us. What he died to give life to is what we want to be and share. Now, we've been in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we've come to see the amazing blessing that it is to be the church, to be the family of God. And we've come to realize that with this privilege comes the responsibility to fight the good fight. And we've seen graphically that spiritual warfare is real, and it starts on the inside and works its way out and then circles around us and tries to come back in, into the church, into the heart, into the head of the individual, that we're all going to be in a spiritual war for the rest of our lives. Now, most recently, we've concentrated on the reality of the war. And then last time, we saw how raw and real the suffering is that comes with this spiritual warfare. And we've seen from God and his word that we are commanded to submit, commanded to submit. We were told it's God's will that we serve like Christ and that it's actually God's call that calls us to suffering like Christ. Well, I've noted that this is difficult, difficult for the cultural church, difficult for everybody, because it goes against our flesh. It goes against everything in us. But my prayer is that you've come to realize, or you will today, that it's God's word that repeatedly says over and over and over and over and over again that this is the call on every Christian. To follow Christ faithfully is to submit to your leaders up to the edge of sin. You don't submit into sin, but you submit otherwise. You serve at high cost, including sacrifice, up to death like Christ as you pick up your cross and you follow him and you come to expect persecution and suffering. Now, again, I've noted that this can be troublesome to many, but it's biblical to all. And I want to show you once again in a way that might be a little unorthodox, but it's purely biblical. I want to take you back eight years ago and show you how this exact same set of principles, same message from a totally different part of God's word, Acts 14, where you'll see again and again and again that God's people have been called to suffer, serve, and submit like Christ and for Christ. I pray that as you see what God is bringing to us from his word, that you'll surrender to victory in Christ, that you'll submit, you'll serve, and you'll suffer, recognizing just how close to home this battle gets, how close to home this battle really is, and that you'll hear from God and then heed his word. I pray this time blesses you, gets personal, and helps you to grow as a glorifier of the living God. Amen and amen. Good morning. Would you pray with me as we open up? Lord Jesus, I come to you now this morning and I just ask you, Lord, to center us on the truth of your word. Lord, prepare each of our hearts, beginning with me, to come into your presence. Lord, let your spirit do through your words work that which is needed in each and every one of us, I pray. Lord, we give this time to you and we thank you for the power of your presence and your promises. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Let's go into God's Word. I would ask each of you, if you would, to open up your Bible and join me in Acts chapter 14. This morning, we're going to be working through and letting the Lord do his work in us through verses 1 through 7 of Acts 14. And let me just prepare you by asking a question on the front side. What is the big idea of the Bible? Would it surprise you to know, friend, that wherever you are in the Bible, wherever you find yourself from beginning to end, it's all about Jesus. Now, I'm blessed to be amongst a people that would say, Pastor Jeff, we know that. Well, you know that because you have surrendered to his word and you have embraced the truth of his word in large part. But let me ask you this. Do you ever get tired of that? You know, you ever get to that place where you say, okay, 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 enough about Jesus? Again, I pray that the answer is no. But I must tell you, honestly, for many, the answer is, yeah, if I'm honest, I do. You know, when we go through the scriptures, it would be nice if it wasn't always about him, many would say. But you know, whether you're talking about creation, the birth of a people, the struggle of a people, the coming of a Messiah, the birth of his church, the explanation of his meanings and ministries, or the promise of his return, which, by the way, is the simplification of the Bible. It's all about him. Always was, always will be. And for many, unfortunately, this becomes a problem. And it becomes a problem in the religious community, those in which religion resides but redemption is lacking where there isn't a restored and repentant relationship with the Redeemer. I've talked to you before and likened the church in many cases to a car wash where people want to just come in, get cleaned off on the outside and head back out looking pretty, but the engine is absolutely run down and in total disrepair. Others want the church to be a classroom where we simply come and say, fill my head, stay away from my heart, just fill my head. Some want a convenience store where the church becomes a place where you come in and go out quickly. By the way, it's all about speed, in and out. I want to be able to get what I think I need. I'll pay a little bit more, I get it, but I love the convenience of just the quick in and the quick out. Some want the church to be a country club. Make it all about me. Give me all the stuff that I want. We turn churches into ministry malls and we treat would-be Christians like wannabe consumers. Now, that's a truth. And God's Word speaks to it directly and indirectly. And it speaks to it consistently from cover to cover. You see, when Jesus is Lord and your understanding of what it is to be a Christian and to be the church puts front and center that Jesus is Lord, it changes everything. Now, I would say to you, and I tell you as we begin, one of the first things it will change is your expectations. Now, if you were to walk through the Bible cover to cover and recognize, as I praise God, many of you would today, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, right? There's the gospel, there's the gospel, there's the gospel, there's the gospel, there's the gospel then you would come to realize that being a Christian and being the church is all about being refined and being reinforced by the truth of the gospel. And my prayer is, as I literally prayed, that the Lord would do a refining work in all of us all day, every day. That it's not a one and done deal. Why do you think it is that God would give us in his word such incredible repetition such simplicity of message through the diversity of all these different details. Have you ever thought about that? Why is it that it keeps coming back to Jesus is Lord? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let me tell you why. Because most of us in our flesh, we want to be Lord. I want to do it my way. I don't want a Lord. I'd love a Savior. 
right? The church in the West, especially in our culture, everybody wants a savior. But you start talking about lordship and say, listen, he's not just your savior, he's your Lord. And if he's not your Lord, he's not your savior. And people start getting a little animated. It starts to get a little ugly. And as I shared with you last week, looking at the closing of Acts 13, I believe that is in large part because most people do not know the gospel. Americans know the Gettysburg Address the way most average Christians or professing Christians know the gospel. Oh, we know it's important, it's a part of our history, and we can quote a little bit from it, but we don't really get it, we don't really know it. My prayer is that when you see that God has seen to it, to repeat over and over and over and over and over and over and over again some core truths that you and I would not resist those truths but embrace them. Now I tell you that because you are about to see in Acts 14 more repetition. More repetition that most people who profess Christ A, not aware of, and B, tend to resist. Now, imagine if you were a soldier and you're now not engaged in war, but you're in the training time. And you come to your training time and you say to the commanding officer, hey, I got an idea. How about we go ice skating instead today? I, I'm just so fed up with this whole soldiering thing and the training thing. I haven't ice skated since I was a kid. Let's do some ice skating. What would you expect from the commanding officer? Let's take it to another place. How about you're the coach or the manager of a sports team, right? So you're the head coach of the football team, um, basketball team, and, and your players show up for practice, and they say, uh, hey, coach, how about you teach us how to be ballerinas? <laughs> I don't want any more basketball. I don't want any more football. Teach me how to be a ballerina. Hey, I know. Let's do hands-on home plumbing 101. Let's do some plumbing work. If you were the commanding officer, or if you were the coach or the manager of the team, you say, hey, what, what do you think we're all about here? We're not about building ballerinas. And I'm certainly not going to get focused on some plumbing. We're all about soldiering. We're all about playing to win the game. And if you're all about playing to win, then when it's time to train, you train. Well, I'm here to tell you, friends, that this is one of the messages that repeats over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible. That if you're being invited to Christ, if you are, in fact, a Christian, if you are committed to being the church, then your life is on mission. And while you will enjoy the fruit of the Spirit, praise God. Walking by faith is life as an ambassador. And I pray to God that we do not confuse faith and fruit. You see, faith will require action of an ambassador. Fruit of that faith will be the aroma of Christ. Watch as we now go with God into his word, Acts chapter 14, and let's begin at verse 1 and watch what happens again. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Now at Iconium, again, I say to you, note the pattern. Paul and Barnabas, if you've been with us, you know, they have left Antioch, home church, First stop, Cyprus. What happened? Warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat, direct frontal assault by a child of the devil. God's words, not mine. What was the purpose? To pursue that single person of peace, that one proconsul, that governor. The praise God was one to the Lord. So we saw day one, first trip. First recorded encounter, spiritual warfare in pursuit of one person of peace. Next, where do they go? Pisidian Antioch. Day two, what do we see? This was last week. First recorded sermon of Paul. What happens? Again, warfare, persecution, division. Right? We see this. 
We watch a people who hear the truth and the love of the gospel. We see the power of God demonstrated through those that were sent, sent by the Spirit of God, obeying the Spirit of God, and what happens? The people respond. What was the response? What's the pattern? Some come, some go. Some fight, some show faith. The context here is going to continue over and over and over and over again, all the way up to present day today. This is why it's so important. If your understanding of a church is a place that's designed to make you feel better, or to give you that which you want, or a place that lets you kind of run the show. That is not the church of the Bible. The church of the Bible is an equipping center of people called out, set apart, supernaturally empowered by God with a purpose to fulfill his priorities under his power. Through the proclamation of truth and love. What did you see in Cyprus? They proclaim the gospel. Here comes the battle. What happens when they get to Pisidia and Antioch? They proclaim the gospel. Here comes the battle, right? They could have opened up a second-hand clothes store. They could have opened up a free food stand. They could have done a number of things that would have been good, but were not in line with what God says to do. Do not confuse the church with the ministry. They go and they proclaim the gospel, and the gospel does what the gospel does. It divides the crowd and it unifies the church over and over and over again, living out not just the facts of the gospel, but the faith of the gospel to truly live what you claim to believe in God's context under his precepts. It will divide every single time, supernaturally, spiritually, Theological truth. The gospel divides the crowd and unifies the church. This is what we see over and over and over again. Now it says that they entered the church, the synagogue, together. I point out to you again the unity. God sends us out. Jesus did it. He sent them out two by two. He said, I'm sending you out. Be as shrewd as a serpent and as gentle or as innocent as doves. This is the pattern. Again, we're together. No lone wolf Christians says that they spoke in such a way. Spoke in such a way. What way? You'll see in just a little bit. Boldly. That's the way. And I ask you, Christian, are you speaking boldly into your context? Are you speaking boldly into your community? The church speaks in such a way that the world takes notice. You see, we speak in the context of koinonia. We speak together. We speak in the context of love, the kind of love that the world finds peculiar, the kind of love that arrests the attention of the superficial, the kind of love that gets ridiculed. If you haven't been there yet, you will be, I promise. And if that promise goes unfulfilled, it's probably because you're not really loving. Because God's word makes it clear, if and when you will walk with him and be his church, you will come under persecution. This too is part of that pattern. And I know that there's a movement afoot in the culture today that says, why do you gotta keep talking about that? Well, here's the thing, friend. If you and I are not contrasting culture, the moment the church blends into the culture, it stops being the church. The minute we don't offer a contrast, we stop being the church by the definition of God and his word. This is the truth. Know this. They spoke in such a way where the power of God is present in his people. There will be a pure, pure proclamation of the gospel. And the gospel will always divide the crowds. And it will unify the church. You see, the consumer-oriented church of our day has no stomach for truth. Sadly, this is the case, and consequently, the church of our day no longer has a backbone for biblical boldness. Because the church does not have a stomach for God's truth, it no longer has a backbone for his call for biblical boldness. I ask you, friends, embrace the authority of God's word. 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Go there. It's God-breathed. It's for the purpose of directing, teaching, reproofing, equipping us for every act of righteousness to go and be. This is lost. Not here, though. In Acts 14, it says that a great number believed. Note both the quality and the quantity is addressed. A great number, so there's hard, high, quality, high quantity, and then the term believed. Now, we know for a fact that not all believing is full believing. Not all disciples are true disciples. But what we see here that we can count on is that there has been a movement afoot and something is happening. I draw you again to Jesus' parable of the soils to recognize that what you and I may see and assume to be positive and eternal may be temporary and short-lived. But that's not our place. We're, we're not the seed sifters, right? We're, we're those that are called to go out and sow and to, to be the church, to help others to come to Christ. Listen to what happens in verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up, uh-oh, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Poisoned their minds against the brothers. First word in the verse, but. It's telling you and me that a contrast is coming, right? We just got the account that, okay, here they come again. The truth tellers, the lovers of God, the missionaries, here they come. What's gonna happen next? Uh Uh-oh, contrast. The unbelieving Jews. Please do not associate unbelieving with only the Jews. You see, unbelief is the problem at the root of all sin. At some point, there's a connection to unbelief at the root of every sin. And you need not be a Jew, right? And it need not be in any particular category. The question is, do you believe God's word? We sang the song, I love that anthem, we believe. We believe the truth of God's word. We believe what he said, we believe that he meant it, and we believe that we're called to live it. And anything else is some form of compromise, rationalizing, point blank, it's sin. God's called us by his grace to live his way. And is he doing it to say, hey, don't do that, don't do that, because I don't want you to have fun, or I don't want you to have a good life. No, he's telling us don't do that because I know it'll hurt you. When he says don't, it's as much out of love as when he says do. And it's proven because all of this is based on what he has done and not on us. He says that they stirred up. I want to take a minute here because, friends, I think some of you have been stirred up. I think some of you have stirred up others in the past. Please understand that God takes this very, very seriously. So much so that he put it in his eternal word here as a reminder and as a reproof that we would learn from others' mistakes. What is it to be stirred up? Well, you could be stirred up to the positive, right? We see this in much of Paul's writing when he says, I urge you. He's saying, I'm stirring you up. I'm I'm trying to initiate action. I I wanna call you to change. And when that's to surrender to Christ and to come into a greater Christ-likeness, we say amen. But there's also a negative stirring up. He says here that the unbelievers stirred up those who claim to believe and the crowd at large. Those that stir up, these are the peace killers. And I want you to ask yourself, are you aware of any peace killers in your life right now? Are you, perhaps, a peace killer right now? If so, repent. And if it's somebody else, repel them. Oh, wait, call them to repentance, and if they will not repent, then repel. But do not be in the presence of those who stir up from unbelief, more unbelief. These are the peace killers. They're the joy suckers. Those that will take from you that which God would give you. They're the spiritual home wreckers. Come into a family of God and create dissension and division. Do you know of anybody that is stirring up, that needs to be confronted, called into repentance and restoration, but not tolerated? It cannot be. 
they're not only the home wrecker spiritually, they tend to say things like, well, hey, I'm just being the devil's advocate here. Well, let me just slow down for a little bit and ask you, do you really want to be the devil's advocate? Think about it. Well, I'm just being the devil's advocate here. I know you are, and you need to stop now because there's no advocacy for the devil welcome here. And that division or that dissension is exactly that. It's an advocacy for the devil. Stop it. They say things like this. Hey, I'm just saying, you know, just saying. And then what follows? Pure poison. Pure poison. You want that around your children? The church, the bride of Christ, also known as the children of God, God doesn't want it around his children either. In the same intensity and seriousness that you would apply in your home, God wants applied in his home. This is incredibly important. Paul and Barnabas show up again, bringing the truth and the love of the gospel, and here comes the unbelieving persecution, and it comes in the form of attack, stirring up. Titus 1.11 says that there were some that were doing that and they were destroying entire households. Therefore, they must be silenced. God's word. So what does this look like? What, what does the stirring up look like? Say, Pastor Jeff, help us with this. It's one thing to say don't or do. It's another thing to equip us and help us get ready. But let me tell you what stirring up looks like. It's drops and at times a deluge of derision. It's dissension whether it comes in drops or a deluge, it's always the same thing. Now, the drops, they tend to come in discerning or disconcerning efforts. It's, it's that, hey, listen, go back to sleep. Don't worry about it. You don't need to think about it. It's not a big deal. Hey, listen, pick your battles, right? Disconcerning drops. Have you heard them? Have you said them? Again, repent and or repel. It's drops or perhaps a deluge of discouragement. You might as well give up. That's never going to work. <laughs> There's no God in that. Right? This is stirring people up. It's stirring them up by first telling them go back to sleep. Another time it's telling them to give up. Stirring people up to the negative. It's disconcerting. It's using doubt like the devil did. Did God really say, you're not going to take that whole Bible thing seriously? Are you? Hey, listen, there's certainly room for some gray area in there. You, you don't have to take that word so seriously. It's also using the deceit of flat out lies. Whether it's lies about God and his word, because some don't do the work of actually being like a Berean and going and checking and seeing if that is in fact what God said, so many people are misled because they're just repeating what was regurgitated, not checking it against the truth of God's word. But then there's also the deceit that comes out against people personally. You know, if I can discredit you through deceit, then others won't listen to you and then they're more apt to follow my lies. Happens all the time. All the time. I ask you, have you been a deceiver or have you been deceived? Again, this is the stirring up. You'd be amazed at how many times you have conversations with people who say, well, I understand, da 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 I say, well, that's not true. That's, that's not even close to true. Well, that's what I heard, yeah. You were deceived by a division-making stirrer-upper. Exactly what you see here in the Scriptures. And again, it happens over and over and over again. Ultimately, you see this in division. Stirring up ultimately creates division. I tell you this, friends, and take it to heart. This is deep theological truth. The devil is in the division. The devil is in the division of God's people. Think about it. Go to Acts chapter 2. We've already been there. Verses 42 through 47. You see the most beautiful picture of the new church. You see this supernaturally unified people. Paul later tells us in Ephesians to, to zealously protect the unity of the body. 
Ultimately, I bring you to John 17 where Jesus prays to the Father and he prays specifically for the unity of the church so that the credibility of the church will be strengthened and that it's in our supernatural unity that Jesus and his proclamation of, as Lord will be believed. Our unity is Christ's calling card. That's what Jesus says in John 17. Is it any wonder that the devil is in the division? He doesn't care how or why you divide. He just wants to splinter the church. This is why you see the persecution. It's not that the devil's out to just bring grief and pain to the Christians. He's trying to persecute to divide. He's trying to persecute to splinter because it's in the unity that the actual witness of the church demonstrates a worship and a walk that draws people's attention to him. Here again, these people, these ones that are stirring up, go into your Bible and look. My favorite example and the clearest one, I think, of one such person is in the Old Testament. Look at Korah. God has instructed and freed his people to follow him. He's put a man of God in place who is listening and obeying, imperfectly, by the way, but passionately. And God is showing up, demonstrating that he is in fact with that leader, Moses. He supernaturally opened up the Red Sea, has brought food from heaven. And over and over and over again, Korah leads the grumbling. Well, I think we ought to go back. Well, who made him, who made him the only one that God speaks to? Ultimately, the very wrath of God comes down on Korah and those with him. And Moses, he prays. He prays for those that are persecuting him. Prays for God's mercy on those that would do the actual grumbling and the hurting. I encourage you, friend, pray for those who are stirring up division. Pray for those who are actually doing the sowing of doubt, disconcern, discouragement, and deceit. Pray that God will arrest their heart with grace before he solves it with his wrath. There's only one of two ways coming. And if you are a Christian, you were one who was worthy of his wrath but received his grace, which means that we should be those on the front lines of praying for mercy and grace for others. This is what we see. In verse 3, so, therefore, either way, your, word, your Bible may translate the first word either way, so or therefore. It's the most important verse word in this verse so or therefore they remained they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord remember now we know how they spoke in such a way that impacted they spoke boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands so or therefore, this is a defining word. When you see so or therefore, it's telling you that what is about to follow is because of what has just been. So what we're about to see is because the unbelievers are stirring up and bringing persecution against them. Well, okay, well, let's see. What's that going to cause them to do? It's going to cause them to stay longer. Do you see what happens when God's people are empowered by his spirit and are set by his priorities and live out his promise, they proclaim the gospel. And when the persecution comes, they proclaim the gospel. And when the temperature gets up, they proclaim the gospel. Because others were being stirred up to division and were being deceived, they stayed longer and did the work of an evangelist. They did the work of the missionary. This is giant, friends. You see in the fact that they remained, you see a commitment to the commission. Christians should live a commitment to their commission. This again is the pattern. Jesus showed it to us all the way to the cross. Jesus told us this was a prerequisite to his disciples. Unless you are willing to pick up your cross daily and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. There's no wiggle room there. You say, well, that's impossible. No, look, Paul and Barnabas are doing it over and over and over again. We saw Peter and John do it over and over and over again. 
We saw Stephen do it all the way to his death. We watched Philip do it in being fluid in following Christ and going wherever God told him to go and do whatever God tells him to do. It's not out of our reach, friends. Filled with the Spirit, you can do everything that God has called and commanded you to do. Void of the Spirit, you will run out of gas. You'll get bitter. You'll become a grumbling, grumpy, old religious person or a grumpy, grumbly, young religious person. It's at the point that you run out of self, that your religion runs dry, that you are forced to do one of two things. Repent and surrender, and I beg you to do that. Or two, you stir up dissension and you attack the messengers. And you seek division because once that house crumbles, then you can look like you sustained and they were the ones that fell. That's exactly what happens over and over and over again, not only in the scriptures, but also in real life. Hear this, friends. Respond to what God is saying. He says they remained for a long time. Truth and love over time creates koinonia. Truth in love over time creates that supernatural unity. We help each other get through our challenges, right? Some things in walking with Christ for you are super easy. That for me, really hard. And vice versa. And all along the path and all along the journey, different challenges and different celebrations happen. And we do that together. We do that in life together. That's the supernatural unity that the world says, wow, you know, I'm I'm watching Richard. I know he struggles with that, but... Did you see Charlie come up alongside him? That's unbelievable. I watched Charlie's strength help Richard through one of those difficult times. That's pretty amazing. Now Richard's kind of starting to look like Charlie. And did you happen to notice how uh, Mary was over there and when she and Terry were going through this thing that uh, even though they're separate families, they, they seemed like their families came together. And I, I know for sure if they went at that or if they were dealing with it alone, they would have been crushed. But it was amazing to watch what happened when their families actually helped one another. You know, not just like the superficial stuff wave at you in the grocery store, but I mean sacrificial. I mean, they came alongside. I, I mean, I know that there were some hard conversations there. I, I saw some, some emotional, spiritual breakage, I think. But praise God, look at how they've, like a broken bone, fused back together. It's stronger than it ever was in both of them. See, this, this is the difference. This is what God calls us to. Speaking boldly to this call to be. Recognizing, yeah, I know it's going to create division. I'm going to divide the crowd every single time I proclaim the gospel. I ask you, go to your Bible. Look at what happens every time the gospel is proclaimed. The crowd is divided and the church is united. Now, if you want to set out to try to figure out how to avoid division in crowds... You'll compromise, and you'll build the cultural church of our day. Jesus described it as lukewarm and threatened to spit it out of his mouth. If you're willing to be the church, then you will speak boldly the truth and the love, not with a hammer, but with a hand, extending the promises, the truth and the love of God's grace. And when somebody says it's this or it's that, look, it's God's word. I didn't write it. I'm reading it. These poison joy suckers, peace killers, the joys and poison peddlers. I say to your friend, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. And if by chance you happen to be making the Kool-Aid, cut it out. Living water. That's what we have. Quench your thirst with living water. I say to you, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Instead, read the book. Don't, read, don't, don't keep drinking the Kool-Aid. Oh, I'm just taking a sip. I didn't say it. I was just listening to it. Get away from the Kool-Aid. Read the book. They continued and they preached boldly. I was told about a year and a half ago that somebody who's no longer with us said if he keeps preaching like that, he's going to preach himself out of a job. It may be. 
but I will be with some of you in heaven and we will never compromise God's word. I've come to understand that where and when the gospel is proclaimed, the crowds are divided. But praise God, the church is united. I want to show you a piece from last week. Because of the repetition in the passage, I bring to you repetition in my message. This was last week doing the exact same point. Watch this. But listen, as Paul now takes us further, and he says, we are the way. In verse 32, he says, and we preach to you the gospel, the good news. Literally, that's the word that's in the Greek. We preach to you this good news, that God himself, the one you fear, that you know from your history, spoke and put everything into play, died on a cross for you came down and voluntarily took your place on that cross. This is the good news. It is the fulfillment, he says, of the promises that were made to our fathers. Verse 33, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he, God, raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Throughout this passage, there are multiple quotes from the Old Testament. Again, using God's word to prove God's word and to present God's word. What you see Paul doing is he's telling them, look, we told you about everything that you knew from your traditions and the past. We told you all about Jesus. We showed you how he's the fulfillment of it. And now we're being this living example. We're the bridge that's taking what you know and what you've rejected and we're bringing it to you in a lovingly confrontational way. You can no longer ignore this truth. And I point out to you what Paul is pointing out to them, friends, especially those of you that have grown up in the church or who are familiar with your Bible, but not yet the blessing of being a child of God. To be informed is not to be inspired. Just because you've been informed with the truth does not mean that you're inspired by and changed and transformed by the truth. In a way to try to get this point across in plain language as, as clearly as possible. If you go tonight and sleep in your garage, you will not wake up an automobile. It does not change you. God changes people. And only Him. Do you know the God of creation who spoke everything into being and then just as quickly and just as shockingly said, I will go to the cross on your behalf. Is this the God you serve? See, I don't think too many people get this full big idea. I don't think when I look out and I see the lukewarmness and the superficial traditions and those that give God literally the scraps from their life, I don't think they know this God. I don't think that there's an understanding of this truth. And, and let me just share with you what Paul now in his sermon offers, which is the warning of God. Verse 40, therefore, because of these truths, take heed, watch out, so that those things that are spoken in the prophets do not come upon you. Friend, church goer, professing Christian, Paul says, as I say to you, Stop playing church. Are you not aware of what God's word says? Look, behold, you scoffers, and marvel, or perish and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days. We are seeing God accomplish a work in our days, and yet there's still a lackluster lukewarmness that permeates our country and our cultural church. And God himself says, do you not see this? Do you not believe that I will bring upon you that which I have said if you play with me? I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, even though someone would describe it to you. You don't just have my word, you have interpreters. I've sent you truth tellers and you're still pushing away. Paul has a passion for the people that God has sent them to. And a part of his passion is he says, stop playing games. Stop 
pushing away. Stop being satisfied with your religion and your traditions and your rituals and your resumes and come surrender your life to Christ, evidenced by the fruit of your life. That's a little creepy to put yourself up on a screen. But I do it because I want you to see the repetition. Every time Paul shows up, you know what those say that see him? Oh, there he goes again. You ever notice that, Paul? He's, he's like a broken record. Boy, gospel, 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 gospel. He, he's always challenging us. Always having to apply. Why can't David and Goliath just be about the little guy winning? Why you got to make it all about Jesus and put the gospel back? I pray to God that every time we are together, and every time I have the privilege to preach and teach God's word, you say, there he goes again. There he goes again. Gospel, 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 gospel. Application, application, application. App. Why don't you just leave me alone? Because like Paul, I have a passion for you, the people that God has given me to under shepherd. And I know it is only the truth that will set you free. And I know the degree to which you have imprisoned yourself. You may even like the change you have put on. But I've been called to do my best to help you surrender to Christ, to know the victory of living in him, not going to church, but being the church. I pray that you see this all throughout the Bible. I don't come to you as some isolated example of some new experiment. I come in the long line of truth tellers. Read the prophets. Read the apostles. You say, well, I'm not crazy about the, the Gospels. Jesus is always challenging. All the epistles, they're corrective letters. They're refining work of God to say, come closer to me. Come walk in a tighter fellowship. Let's be a greater reflection of Christ. I don't want to go to practice saying, well, hey, we won the game last week. Hey, coach, how about this week? Let's go do the ballerina stuff. Every single day, we want to be about playing to win because souls are in the balance and the glory of God is what we are representing. If you remember the Olympic hockey team, the U.S. Olympic hockey team that won the gold medal in 1980, they called it the miracle far cry from a real miracle. But in the depiction of that account, there's a place in the movie where the coach says to the team, a bunch of prima donnas, by the way, says to the team, until you people realize the name on the front of the jersey is a heck of a lot more important than the name on the back, you're never going to be the team that you could be. Oh, what a truth that parallels the church. This is what Paul was all about. This is what Jesus was all about. This is what Peter was all about. This is what John was all about. And I pray to God, this is what Jeff is all about. And I pray even more that this is what you become. All about Jesus. That you understand the meaning and the purpose and the beginning and the birth of the church. We're all about him. First sermon ever preached at the bridge. First sermon I ever shared. I prayed through intentionally. The title of the sermon, it's not about you. So that we could always come back to this place of remembering it's all and only about Christ. We as his ambassadors, this is who we are. You see, where and when these are our priorities then not only will we preach and teach the truth, it'll be for the Lord. That's what the word says. They were doing it for the Lord. Their actions and attitudes, God-honoring, Christ-centered, for the Lord. It says, who bore witness. These are the folks. This is Paul and Barnabas. This is you and me, church. Who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. God will show up and his power Power flee precedes the pure proclamation of his gospel and then powerfully post-stamps the effects. 
you will see the signature of God where the children of God will share and speak his truth in love. The proof, we've talked about this earlier in Acts, the greatest proof of the power and promise of God tends to be the people of God. There was a demonstration of miraculous work done here in Acts, oftentimes to validate the apostles and the truth tellers, to differentiate them from the liars and the deceivers. In our day, friends, while God is never limited in any way, the primary way in which he proves himself is through the presence and the power of his people, living out his power and promise in priority. The greatest demonstration I think we have as a church family is those of you in whom Christ now lives where before he did not and so to the grumbling and to the derision and the division those who would stir up from unbelief with unbelief to unbelief I say as Paul would say look around See the power and the promise of God in the people of God. He is alive, evidenced by those who have his life in them. Moses, would you come? I want to share with you this morning a beautiful demonstration of God at work. Christian, this is our brother, Moses Kagosi, who next Sunday will be baptized in Harvey's Lake in Barnet, Vermont as a declaration to what God has done and is doing. He will be the first one baptized in the bridge, Vermont, and he will come from Kampala, Uganda to do it to demonstrate how God has miraculously been at work unifying us. I come from Kampala, Uganda, I first came to the United States to attend the International Arts Conference. The following year, I returned to do an exhibition. I was staying with a friend in Stevensville, and I was waiting for them at Kmart parking lot. They delayed to collect me I was, as I was standing there, this is when I met Christine and Joe and their son Raymond. We had a little chat. They decided to give me a list, a lift, a ride to my friend's home. As we are heading towards my friend's home, uh, Christine told me, do you know Jesus? I said, yes. But again, in my mind, I, uh, I didn't want to offend them. I said, I know Jesus. I've heard about Jesus at school in Africa. I hear, I hear about Jesus in the news, in the papers, everywhere. I know him. You don't need to tell me. I mean, but I didn't talk to them in person. But my mind was saying, don't tell him. I know him. After that, I returned back to Africa. So we kept in touch. So it was after one and a half years, I realized that God was calling me. At times, God calls you, and it can take years and years. So the miracle of grace came to me. God saved me. I didn't realize that my life would change, that God wants me from where I was to where he wants me to be, and it can take Yes, he just keeps calling you, come, 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 come to me. Now I see that God wants me from where I, where I was to where he wants me to be. I continue to share this. I'm a social worker with the communities I serve, and I give the bread of life to the children, Amen. And and love to them, and it's him who saves. Before I end, I know you know this, 
I just want to remind you to remember that Jesus is Lord. Thank you. Amen. I will tell you this, and we can have further discussion. I'd love to share more. Moses will share more with you. The night that Christine met Moses, she had just repented. Earlier in the afternoon, she had decided she was not going to go on the missions trip to Vermont and that she was not able. And then realized she had given in to fear and repented. We spoke and said, Christine, you're an adult. You do, you're responsible for your own actions and you can do what you want to do. But I promise you this, God's blessing follows his obedience. And that doesn't mean it'll be easy. The blessing may come through extremely difficult times. But there's no blessing to be found in disobedience. And Christine repented, prayed, and obeyed. And she was at Kmart to get her last-minute supplies because in the morning at 5 o'clock, we were heading to Vermont. And it was in the midst of her obedience that she met Moses. And for almost two years, there's been a direct technologically enhanced discipling that's been going on. For the last six months, a Skyping relationship every Saturday morning, well, Saturday afternoon, <laughs> 6 a.m. our time, 2 o'clock, Moses' time. All of this is a demonstration of a modern-day miraculous move of God. And now Moses is being asked to teach and in essence to preach to the children at the orphanages out into the bush where he goes. He's now being asked to come into the prisons where, as he said, he gives the bread of life. He is a missionary. He is, in essence, what modern-day people might call a church planter because he's making disciples where he goes. He's now being asked at the orphanages to teach the leaders how to teach the children the gospel. That's the best response to anybody that wants to try to stir you up that I know. This is church. It's in very real persecution. Moses will tell you in his country it's much more dangerous than it is here to proclaim openly. It's becoming more dangerous and more uncomfortable here. It's going to get worse. Be ready. Live this. Live it. Let us be I say to you, closing out verses four, five, six, and seven, but the Bible, but the people of the city were divided. Again, go and teach and preach the truth and you will divide the crowd every single time. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Can't we just coexist? Sure, temporarily. You're on borrowed time, friend. There is division. Remember, you can lead a horse to water, but you and I, we cannot make that person drink. At the same time, you and I need to recognize that while we can't lead somebody to accept Christ, if I can paraphrase Charles Spurgeon, while I can't stop anybody from going over the cliff into hell, I ought to make sure that those around me do so with my fingernails embedded in their ankles. Again, that we live that love of God that loves people. Verse 5 and 6, when an attempt was made by both, men, by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers, everybody, Gentiles, Jews, and rulers, to mistreat and to stone them. The proclaimers are going to be mistreated and stoned. Friends, Jesus was clear. The scriptures are clear. If you will live on mission, if you will truly be the church and not just play church, you will be persecuted again and again and again and again. God's word is saying this. I repeat it to you over and over because I'm so afraid that people will get what they want. A church where there is no call to being. A church that lives a blended, lukewarm life so that it doesn't know these persecutions that we see from the scripture. Oh, it'll feel good. It's like bath water. The problem is that you'll be spat out of that. Per Jesus in Revelation 3. It says, when an attempt was made, not if, but when, 
an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them. Six, verse six, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. I just want you to see this. Some people will say, aha, look, cowards. They're not cowards. This is a demonstration of courage, evidenced by what will follow as you will see them return. They're not leaving and running away based on a fear and a compromise. They are living on mission. They are going to further preach and teach the word of God. And in fact, they will soon be coming back to reinforce what was done here. There's a world of difference between cowardice and shrewdness. And again, you and I have been called and equipped with the spirit of God to discern the difference Don't get pushed into something. And again, note, mistreated, stoned, look at Jesus. Look at Peter and John already. We're in in chapter 14 of Acts and Peter's already been in prison twice. Stephen's been stoned. Paul, Barnabas, they've already been confronted and we're seeing the division and the attacks happening. When the church begins to blend into the culture, it stops being the church. These guys never look for the path of least resistance. They proclaim the gospel. And verse seven says it very clearly. We'll pick up here next week. It says, frankly, they continued. Their commitment to the commission was unwavering. Their witness was unwavering. I say to you friends, don't drink the Kool-Aid. If after today you choose I encourage you to go to the website and drop down the notes. Download the notes. There's an account that I put in the end of my notes of a survivor of the Jim Jones massacre. One who tells the story of how the Kool-Aid was made and what was involved in the drinking of it and just how heinous it could be. And I almost was going to show you an overhead shot, an image of the 918 bodies that lay dead in 1978 after they drank the Kool-Aid. Jim Jones didn't come from way, way, way out in left field, although that's exactly where he was. He sounded good. Most that knew him and were around there, they trusted him. He seemed to be good-natured. On the surface, had a great heart, or so they said. It's believed that about 30% of the 900 plus lives that were lost were children that day. And at the risk of maybe making people uncomfortable, why are you gotta talk about Jim Jones in church? Because if that picture stirs you to a place of disgust and concern, how much more when we talk about eternal hell and damnation. Souls. Poison or passion? What are you filled with? What are you sharing? Are you a part of the poison or the protection of God's people? Here again, first seven verses of Acts chapter 14. It's like Groundhog Day. We keep coming back to these same principles. Here we go again. Here he goes again. I pray that you see this is the birth and the being of church. You have no greater responsibility in all of your life than to represent the king that you claim has set you free. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. I thank you for the freedom that comes through your truth, that you sanctify us through your word, your truth. Lord, let us be a people that do not skirt away from the full context of your word, but let us be those that come graciously, humbly, thankfully to the refining fire of the work that your spirit will do in us. Let us stop pushing away. Let us recognize 
that while we will know a joy that is better than anything else that the world has to offer in being your people, that this journey is not about down here. We're sojourners. That this is a journey home. Let us live out our lives loving you, preparing to come home and to bring as many with us as possible. And if that comes at a great cost, I pray that we expect it so that we don't resist it. And that in our embrace of you, no matter what, that others will see that you are worth it. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.